All right, David's favor here. Today is Wednesday, October the 5th, 2011, and we're talking about bootstrapping great ideas into great cash flows. Nobody better to talk with about that than this guy. <laughs> so, um, um, specifically, bootstrapping using the Thousand True Fans model. And if you're familiar, unfamiliar with the Thousand True Fan model, uh, you can email David at davidfavor.com and ask me about the best link for that article. So anyway, you're in for a treat this morning. I've got a wicked, smart, super cool friend on the phone. So um, introduce yourself. What's your name and claim to fame? My name is David Gonzalez. My claim to fame is... Uh, I didn't realize I was famous yet. <laughs> oh, dude, man. Well, infamous or... I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I... Yeah, it, so I got to tell everybody who's listening, David Gonzalez, it's kind of an interesting story. As a child, he wasn't wanted, and now he's wanted in 12 states. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> yeah, no, I, my 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 ideas of what famous means are are just pretty <laughs> to me to me anybody who's not who's not at least as I don't know. Well, I'll talk about your big activity and also uh, uh, how people can hook up with you, buddy. <clears throat> All right. Well, I've, I mean, I I. I uh, in the in the digital marketing uh, entrepreneur space, or anyone who wants to to learn how to market their business or their service or their passion online, uh, lots of people in that realm know me for having started something called the Internet Marketing Party. Yeah. And so, what was the follow up question? Oh well, so how? What's the best way for people to hook up uh, with you to participate in your uh, ongoing fun adventures? Um, let's see, you can, uh, internetmarketingparty.com. I've got, uh, that's, that's one of my main websites. Cool. And, uh, reaching me, uh, you can do David at velvet rope joint ventures.com. Cool. So, well, well, and um, you know, for the advanced that. people listen to this, talk about Velvet Rope. Just give it like a, a top level view of that. I mean, Internet Mark, we'll give a top level view of Internet Marketing Party and then also Velvet Rope. Okay. And in case folks are watching, going, I, I didn't know we were doing a, a video interview up until just a few minutes ago. So, <laughs> David didn't prep me with any of the questions, and I, I didn't know what. Well, he that'd be no good because then you could uh, plan, right? <laughs> Yeah, I just feel like uh, there, there's probably at least one person listening right now going, uh, this guy looks like he was just, you know, sideswiped. Well, and that, that's the difference between, um, you know, people that uh, talk about working from home and people who work at home all the time, like you and me, is that, you know, most of the time, like I, I did brush my hair and put on a shirt. Yeah. And yesterday yeah. I shaved. I didn't shave today, but I did shave yesterday. When David called this morning... A little while before our call. I, anyway, we should probably get on with with, with uh, um, high level overview of Internet Marketing Party is uh, it's a it's a community of of uh, online marketers and it's not just online marketers. It's anyone who has a a business or a passion that they want to spread the word about and learn how to leverage the internet. Right. Um, whether it's email marketing, whether it's pay-per-click marketing, whether it's writing a compelling offer, whether it's uh, you know Facebook, social media advertising, using anything that has to do with the World Wide Web, mobile marketing, to uh, to get your word out, your message out more. Uh, we we focus on fun yeah. and kind of like a la just a casual, laid-back attitude. And um, the way that Internet Marketing Party came into being is that um, whenever I'd go to conferences, seminars, or, uh, or workshops, I was noticing that all, you know, they always have a speaker in a big conference room, you know, and uh, a, th a third to a half of the folks that are at the, that are paid registrants for the convention or the workshop are, ha are out in the hallway or at the bar doing the real deals. They're not in the room listening to the speaker. So um, every once in a while, I would find myself in the room listening to the speaker. And nine times out of 10, it was just a big pitch fest. Uh, they were giving away some content. And at the very end, it was like, but if you want the whole story, you've got to buy my $2,000 package at the back of the room. Yeah, that's no good. <clears throat> but every once in a while, I'd go listen to somebody who was a good friend of mine on stage and either 
it didn't matter that it was a pitch fest because what they were giving was really valuable or it was a good friend who was doing well enough they didn't need to pitch anything so their content was really really good and i went huh i wonder how many other people there are out there that you know want would like to hear something like this so because i had a pretty extensive network of a very 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 successful online marketing superstars i uh, started putting together this thing called the internet marketing party it's it's uh it's we just celebrated our three-year anniversary and what we realized is that instead of bringing the speaker to a hotel or a convention center where people would then sneak out and get drunk and do deals at the do, bar do, do business in the back yeah that we would just bring the speaker to the bar and uh that's what we've done well and, one of the things you're famous for saying is uh you know party in the front business in the back right <laughs> so you just put it's, them all together so it's uh it's party it's, and business in front and back all together it's the it's the we, we call it the reverse mullet you know <laughs> the, the mullet hairdo so yeah i'm, I'm party in the front yeah but business, business in the back business in the back <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> anyway, so that's <clears throat> that's put me at the at the center of a lot of uh, some of the best. I mean, some of the biggest best names uh, that you've heard of, the gurus, the industry experts, are making good money, meaning ten, fifteen, twenty million a year. But the guys that are really making money. <laughs> And what I mean by it is like 50, 60, 70, 80 million and up. Um, some of those folks uh, have, have, are coming into my circle because they see that they're, you know, one of the things I learned, uh, I'm surprised I had never heard it, but I heard Bill Phillips say it from stage and that's at, at, a, at an event a couple of months ago. And that's all business is basically a giant ecosystem. Oh, and yeah. it's not, as an entrepreneur, your job is to create something from nothing and build it to the point that a bigger fish swallows it. Yeah, there you go. You know, so you should start as an entrepreneur with the exit strategy in mind and yep. that exit strategy optimally is being bought out by a bigger company that isn't in the business of making things, they're in the business of acquiring things that work well. Yeah, and running and when them. I heard yeah. that it kind of shifted my my whole thinking about a lot of things i uh anyway so um we'll give I, a give a quick top level overview of velvet rope uh, ventures too for people that um, yeah. are you know in that category that might use that right yeah i've got a, a a business partner with the velvet rope joint venture business his name's jonathan herbert and uh he he's uh more the face of that business or uh we we do really well because of the internet marketing party puts us at the hub of all these rock star marketers and really folks that are doing very well online and it what velvet rope joint ventures is is we're we are a marketing campaign facilitation company so cool. we 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 match mailers uh email marketers that have big captive audiences of email lists and blog readers and and iPod or what is it, what is it called when you listen to podcast podcasts all these iPad iPod i podcast audiences yeah it's with, the it's the radio station model where a, a radio show host has a big following and um, you you're the radio show host sort of and also the guest. So right. the host has got a big following, and if a guest would like to come on the show and talk to the following, you're the broker that puts the guest together with the host. Uh, yeah, and so it's like that as well as the advertiser, because the advertiser could either be an affiliate or it could be the actual merchant. Right. Um, and in the case you're talking about, the, the, ho the guest actually has a product or an offer or a service. Right. But in this case, it could be the guest's affiliate that you know puts a puts an ad on the on the station break. Yeah. So, so the we'll, the other part of the radio show model is that uh, you know you've got sponsors. Like if you got a radio show running and if you got like you know some sort of soap commercial or something. So um, yeah. so if you're yeah if you have a a big list or a product that uh, works with uh that, well that you imagine might work with a big list, then uh, you can get in touch with uh, uh, Dave and Jonathan and and uh, you know, 
but be aware that uh, you'll get vetted, right? Tell them your vetting process. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I was just having a conversation with a friend this morning, and I didn't realize that in, in the internet marketing space, because I didn't, I didn't get involved to become a JV broker, but I didn't realize, because it, I kind of found myself here, that because it happens so organically that most people in the internet marketing space look at JV brokers as, as, as whores. <laughs> and filthy whores, too. Interesting. <laughs> Yeah, because they'll basically sell their, they'll sell whatever for whoever, and we well, don't. Well, but that's not how you run your business, right? So we are not that, and uh, but it's funny because sometimes you have to use a word that people are familiar with, even if that word isn't one that I want associated with. But um, what we do is is we represent offers. We'll only represent offers. Once we have a real clear idea of who they've performed best with, like what audiences they've performed best with and what audiences they've performed poorly with, because then what we do is we match them up with audiences that are most like the ones that they've performed well with. And um, we keep a really, really detailed database mm -hmm. of both the audience as well as the merchant side the, we call them mailers but for folks listening they might not know what that means so it's the audience it's the, the folks with the big audience and we interview them as well um and we identify what what offers have done best and worst with them so when we put people together it doesn't matter if if the merchant and the mailer are best friends if they haven't worked together, we facilitate that campaign. So right. it's not about an introduction. It's not about, I mean, it could be two people that invited me to dinner with them mm -hmm. and I facilitate their campaign even though they already knew each other because yeah. they invited me together. Well, talk about the vetting process for merchants too because I, I think that's something that most people, um, you know, they come up with a product idea or service idea and they think they're going to go out to somebody with a quarter million person list and just have a mail for them and that, that ain't the way it works. Right. So right. Uh, talk about the, you know, your four or five points that uh, your checklist that you go down sure. with uh, new merchants or well, providers. Well, first, of, first of all is um, your offer must be valid. I mean, your product's got to do what it says it does. It's got to be real and do it. Yeah. Do what it says. Yeah. Yeah. Because I can tell you that I've got a case that that will keep your iPhone charged for for two weeks and have a 99% conversion rate on it. But if it's really just nothing more than a piece of plastic that doesn't really do that, <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do with it. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, so it's got to actually work as advertised is number one. Number two is after it works as advertised, it's still got to have great customer support behind it. Yep. Um, because sometimes just because something's works as advertised, the, you know, the, the, the end user might not might not realize that you've got to click the specific little hidden button back here. And, and if you've got a team of outsourced customer support folks that have a hard time with the English language, um, that's not going to fly for us. And in case anybody's wondering why that matters to us as the campaign facilitators is because we're representing the 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 audience's side and so if we bring them a great offer that converts really well mm -hmm. but then once their audience buys it they get upset because they're they couldn't get anybody to answer their questions right it reflects poorly on us it makes us look like oh you sure you made me some money but now half the people on my show or on my in my audience are are, are upset with me because you know, and they've they've opted off of being of listening to my show anymore because I promoted this thing that supposedly work. It does work, but I couldn't figure it out. So there's that, and yeah. so there's good well, that that's kind of goes back to the rule of that uh, great marketing sells product, and great product and great service keeps great product sold. Right, right, right. So it's it's internal systems and external perception cool. is another way that I've heard it. You know, um, and then the the third is. Uh, just that, you, I mean, you're, you're, it's, it's got to convert. It, the, it, that conversions have to do well, and that has more to do with the offer than the product. So it's, it's conversions. It's that the product does what it says when you, advert, when, you, when you make it convert. And then third is that it's got good customer support. 
And well, to this- explain to if somebody's kind of new to the the lingo of uh, online marketing and all this backroom sort of um, JV design, uh, explain what conversions and EPC might mean. Okay, well, conversions mean that if I a conversion rate depends on what you're looking at, but in this case, we're talking about sales conversion, right? And and it means that if I drive a hundred people. 100 visitors to your website or to your offer, whatever that looks like, um, uh, that at least an industry minimum, because it ranges from market and niche to niche, so I'm not going to give an actual number. Uh, Special effects. That's Dexter, my dog. That's Dexter, Sharon. Just got got here. So, hey. Hey. Um, Wrapping up this. Are we wrapping up? I think we're wrapping up, right? I've well, kinda... we're, we're going to have to speed up here. But anyway, go ahead yeah. and wrap up on this a uh, little bit here. Yeah, so uh, conversion rate refers to um, the number of, of individuals who actually purchase the offer that was put in front of them. So, um, if, so some... if 10 people buy, then you get a 10% conversion rate out of 100. Right. right. And so when I reference conversions, if industry, if the industry standard is – a 5% conversion rate and somebody comes to me and they go, hey, will you promote my stuff? I hear you have access to millions and millions of emails. Um, I'll say, well, how, how's your product converting? And if they look at me like I just asked them, you know, are, do they believe in aliens? Yep. Um, then I, you know, I, I, it's a no-go because I, I'm not just, I'm not going to test my, you know, their, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not in the business of building their offer. Right. I'm in the business of matching good people. And, yeah, you're a matchmaker. Uh, and then facilitating that process because it's not just a matter of going, David, meet John. John, yeah. meet David. Go do business. It's a matter of, you know, kind of explaining to one and the other why they, you know, they might need to tweak their their marketing message for this person's audience and why this person's, even though this isn't the normal kind of offer that their audience is used to getting, that this uh, this quirky offer did really really well with this other audience that's just right. like theirs and they would have never believed but it was a fluke over here so we were willing to see if it's a fluke over here too so what's epc <laughs> tell people what that is and how that relates to conversions epc is earnings per click and uh that means that if you're it, it typically refers to uh email marketing but obviously it's not limited to just email marketing but in the email marketing space it means if you've got a list of uh, a thousand people on your you know and and i we bring you an offer and uh for every hundred people that click you know how many people click on the link how many of them will actually buy yeah so you've got a uh, thousand people and a hundred people click through and then you might have 10 people buy so that's the conversion yeah that's that's the earnings per click it means for every person that click how many dollars were earned yep and on average i mean that's a number that's a little more standard but uh even that ranges on whether it's what the offer is if it's straight to a sales page versus right. going to a webinar those are two very different earnings per click because one is where you're basically giving somebody a lot of great content in the webinar and a bit of a uh you know educational uh, component where people go wow that's really great and then they're 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 presented with an offer as opposed to just driving them to a sales page where you know you're leaving it up to their attention span as to whether or not the offer is going to convert so an earnings per click on a straight sales page anything over a dollar is typically going to be worth worth consideration and in a webinar model anything over you know two to four dollars is going to be worth consideration worthy of consideration and well that'll, that'll be good you know so that way people will only contact you if they've actually you know won't waste your time like they'll know what they got to do all right well we're gonna have to blaze through the rest of this buddy okay so um uh back to internet marketing party uh how'd you attract your first true fan mm. how'd you bootstrap it well <clears throat> i you didn't even realize that I was bootstrapping it until just recently because <laughs> I, uh, I wasn't doing it out of, let's put it this way. Um, 
I, my, I didn't even realize that I had my first true fan until uh, just recently as well. I'm, I'm kind of, there's certain things that I just, I, how I got even, how I even got involved in the in, internet marketing space was I read Tim Ferriss's four hour work week and I had mm -hmm. just sold a million dollar a year business. And I realized after getting out of that business that I, the next thing that I did, I wanted to be more of a lifestyle business, something that I didn't really feel like I was working so much as that I was just engaged in the process of living and in, of doing something that made me feel alive and that I was also making money from. And so when I got involved in the internet marketing community, um, I didn't know where I fit, but I did know that everybody kept saying I was a great networker and great facilitator of you know kind of a social lubricant like i help bring people together and you know people just felt taken care of and hosted yeah no matter where i was so i put together this thing this networking event and uh i think the first one had 30 or 40 people at it you know so how, how'd you start that i mean uh so you just picked a bar and sent out an email to some friends or how, how'd you bootstrap for your your gig yeah yeah just uh uh, picked uh, picked a location and uh, told them I had no idea how many people I'd have there, but that you know worst case scenario was going to be bringing them business, and we negotiated out a deal, and uh, and it was there was a little bit of risk there, but it was just it wasn't real risk. It was just it was psychological risk, but I mean there was actual financial risk. Cool. But uh, that sometimes that's actually pretty valuable because it, it kicks you into high gear in a way that if there's no risk, you just go, eh, let's see what sticks. Whereas if there's real risk there, you you put the pedal to the metal in a different way. So I, what I did is I reached out to, uh, to you know, at, I don't know how many people I reached out to. I think the first time I probably contacted about 20 or 30 people and I personally and I just, you know, told them. But this would be a great opportunity for networking and for brainstorming and masterminding and joint ventures to happen, and they showed up. And that's, that's the same way we started too. It's fifty people out of my address book, and that bootstrapped into a global business ten years later. Right, cool. which leads me to uh, to the point of if any if if anybody's listening right now and they go, well, I don't have fifty people in my address book that I could reach out to then you might want to consider looking inwards and asking yourself you know what what could you do different because if yeah. you know, if you're not if you're not connected to at least 50 people that 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 you could pick up the phone and would come to something you know would would show up um then chances are you've been taking more than giving for too long <laughs> You know that's a good point too. Maybe I'll I'll start up a, a couple of smaller projects that are creating your first ten or a hundred true fans for people that um, a thousand is too big a number. That's interesting. I hadn't even thought about that. I hadn't either. We, just, we, we talk we talk all the time, and every, I think nine out of ten conversations we have, we go, "Damn, we should have recorded that." <laughs> yeah. Well, let's uh, let's rock on here, buddy, because we got um, a few more questions and we're running close on time here. Uh, share your top three ways for people to attract their first or next thousand true fans. Um, top three ways. Yeah. Tips, tricks, tech, whatever. Well, uh, I, I mean, I always get tripped. My psychologically, I always get tripped up with top three ways because. Especially since I didn't, wasn't prepped with these questions, so I'm just going to come up with three ways, not yeah. three ways. Um, I'm kind of literal in in my thinking. Uh, uh, so three ways. One is um, create something of real value yep. that is not obvious, and that, like, in other words, put some put some put some elbow grease into it, put some sweat into it, like. So make something and, unique, in other words, right? Yeah. Don't just like another free report on something that any any jackass could google and find on their own you know like really think it i mean put your creative hat on and think and one way to do that is to to take a survey ask ask five people in the space whatever market you're in and by the way don't pick internet marketing it's uh, it's 
not because I don't want competitors. I mean, I'm so far ahead. Of you. <laughs> uh, but just I, I'd I, say I, the I, same thing. Yeah, internet I mean, marketing. I think people mistake. They think internet marketing is somehow some sort of business, and really, internet marketing is machinery to facilitate something promoted of true value. Yeah, because. Let me tell you why picking internet marketing is the worst thing ever. I actually just read a report by Rob Toff, who, uh, out of Vancouver, a really good friend of mine and somebody you should check out. Um, I had never heard, him, never heard anybody crystallize it this way, but information marketing is a billion, multi-billion dollar a year industry, mm -hmm. okay? And out of all the different information marketing spaces, whether it's how, you know, how to open a, create, uh, I mean, how to do a, do karate to how to grow the perfect tomato garden to how to you know homeschool your kids to how to put insulation in your it doesn't matter what it is the only marketplace where information marketing uh requires that you give big in uh financial claims is internet marketing yeah you make sense interesting yeah so if you want to become a successful internet marketer as an info, pro, info publisher, as an information marketer, you have to show, give proof that you've made a lot of money as an, as an internet marketer. And or so, you can do like most internet marketers and just lie about it, right? Exactly. So, yeah. and even then, okay, so the ones that are, you're, you're, so you're competing against liars or against people who really are making boatloads of cash it's a tough market to yeah and among and you're also competing against amongst against people who are exquisite at what they do because the ones that are really making boatloads of cash they're really good at what they do and because it really really works the best thing to do in the whole world is to take the techniques that you're learning in internet marketing and apply them to something like how to grow the perfect rose garden. Yeah. Or think about it this way. Whatever you are, that are listening right now or watching right now have done for the last seven years consistently at your job, at, at whatever you, whatever, mm -hmm. think, look at your bookshelf, look at your YouTube channel views, look at your, what is it that you're naturally doing on a regular basis? Look at your receipts, go to Quick, Quicken or QuickBooks and look at the non-essential things that you've bought over the last seven years. And that's what you're naturally inclined towards. And if you say, oh, it's all about business and marketing, well, then figure out what specific element of business right. and marketing you always lean towards. And if you say, well, it's always about how to make money in mar with marketing, well, then figure out how to become a really good copywriter and then do something. Mm -hmm. on, but even, yeah, my, my guess is most people that are listening right now haven't all just bought primarily books on marketing and yeah. business. there's got to be some other interest you have well i i call it the 10 year rule too whatever you've done for the last 10 years almost every day without pay likely you'll do for the next 10 years every day without pay yeah and so, so if you, you you know the, the the challenge is if you pick some random topic like you know like a, a buddy of mine read some internet marketing report here recently and decided that golfers were a good market to sell to he's never picked up a golf club never been to a uh, a golf green and now he started a golf tip site so he's a poser and so you know don't don't you know randomly drink the internet marketing kool-aid and read something or think that you've come up with some great new thing do what you know right so the three yeah. things that i pulled out of what you said is that create something unique of true value uh, use surveying uh, to uh, determine how to design your product and then um uh, be sure and pick a, a niche um, that you know enough about where you can actually create something of unique value. And, and optimally, pick something that, pick an element of your niche that you actually are interested in. Right. So if somebody, if you're listening right now and you go, well, I've done, the thing I've been doing for the last 10 years has been being a bookkeeper and I hate my job. Well, then identify what's kept you doing bookkeeping for 10 years in spite of the fact that you hate it mm -hmm. and write a report about how or do you know come up with your you know 23 tips on how to stay sane as a bookkeeper or right. you know how to make bookkeeping interesting because i guarantee you right now there are 
tens of thousands of people who are not doing bookkeeping their bookkeeping because they think they find it dreadful and you figured out how to make it you know palatable enough to do it for 10 years and that's just obviously an yeah. example well but, another way to look at that too is uh, chris anderson's long tailing where like in in my niche i started out with uh, health and then alternative health and then um, vegetarianism, veganism, raw foodism, superfood. So it long tailing going farther and farther down the long tail to become more and more tightly niched, where there's uh, the niche is uh, much smaller and the people are more avid fans of whatever the niche relates to. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's rock and roll here. So, um, uh, running engines require fuel. Too big engine in any activity. You and your true fan machine. So, first off, what's your best tips, tricks, and tech for keeping yourself running at continuous peak energy, mood, and focus? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> you know the answer to that. Well, One, you got the same answer that I do, probably. Right. Yeah. I love chocolatebliss.com. Yeah, I bet. so yeah, so to, for David Gonzalez's big secret, go to I love chocolatebliss.com and buy, you know, um, a year's worth of everything there, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, and it's spelled just like it sounds. I love chocolatebliss.com. Yeah, so, um, so it won't, uh, we'll, so obviously we'll, one of them is is um my wife and I, you know, Ching, Ching. Drink stuff. I mean, it's funny because I, I, uh, when I first heard you say that that you've lived primarily on this stuff for for seven years, you know, I was like, wow. Well, he looks pretty healthy. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll I'll try that for a dollar. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I'm going on two years now. And you know my friends, all, a lot of my my partner Jonathan always you know brags. He goes, "Yeah, Dave will be up till three in the morning, and he'll be the first one up in the morning." Because you know I hang out with all these guys like drinking copious amounts of alcohol and all sorts of other <laughs> stuff till three, four in the morning, and they're you know usually asleep till ten or eleven, and I'm up, ding ding ding, you know, like sending emails and doing stuff, but. Uh, same way with me, man. I mean, the, the, the best way is to run your body at uh, continuous peak, and I can't imagine doing that on inebriance. Right. Or, right. or, you know, cooked, processed, dead animal, you know, mystery meat. Right. So. So there's, uh, that. that's one. Another is, I mean, uh, let me think here. Uh, balance, I take, I, you know, I take, I, I do my best to, to not work more than an hour or two at a time without getting up and taking my dog for a walk or doing something like I don't just st just staying seated, you know, for four, five, six hours. I hear guys bragging like, oh, you know, I've been just at my computer sitting for eight hours straight working on copy and blah, blah, blah. It's like that's not really something that you should be bragging about. No, that sounds unfun to me. Well, I mean, and to them, I think they, you know, I, I don't know. It, I don't think they're producing their best work that way. Yeah. That they're just, you know, whatever. But uh, um, a third, you know, uh, a third piece is do something that's fun. I mean, do I mean do whatever it, it ties in with what we were talking about earlier. But if, if what you're doing doesn't necessarily feel like work, um you know, you're, you're going to be energized by it. If you're doing like your buddy right, right. that's the golf tips, you know, pro as of yesterday, it's probably not going to be fun because it's like you're learning a whole new activity in a new language while you're learning the new language. It's like you're doing two things at once and that's going to be very taxing. So, cool. you know, the, I tend to lean towards doing things that I have a natural affinity for uh, or a natural interest in. And that makes it to where it doesn't really feel like I'm, you know. Yeah, for me, my rule is if it ain't fun, it don't get done. <laughs> right. All right. Well, so um, uh, if you had to start over to do uh, start over today, um, bootstrapping your uh, uh, activities, uh, anything you'd do different, or would you do the same thing? Just send yeah. out an email and say, "Let's get together and party." Oh. Um... Pick something that you, in your heart of hearts, and if you looked in the straight yourself in the mirror in a really like important moment, 
that you can truly, truly with every fiber of your soul know that 10 years from now, you can still be doing that oh, and, you're yeah. still, and you're still going to be just as interested in it. That's a good, uh, that's a good uh, piece of advice there. Because otherwise, people are just, it kind of circles back to that thing where I said, if, if there aren't 50 people you could call that, wouldn't, that would show up if you invited them to something, chances are you've gotten to be known as a flake that's just jumping from thing to thing. Yeah. And that doesn't really have a, a kind of like a brand or something that you're known for known to be passionate about and really interested in and really to be a, an authority in um so yeah well, that sounds like some good words of wisdom to wrap up with thanks david yeah you're welcome and I'll, uh, so uh, if you'd like to hook up and uh, hear more from david um, if you're in or near austin be sure and uh, join us this saturday at uh, beats for breakfast all right beats for breakfast beats for breakfast take care buddy take care thanks for having me yep ciao all right bye-bye